Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Karel Chambil. I work with HIVOS as an evaluation manager. And I won't talk to you about governance of m and &E. I don't know what that means, but this was the title given to me by Cecile. So, uh, <laughs> but from the explanation she gave to me, I understood more or less uh, what she was expecting of me. I hope I can live up to that expectation, uh, which goes under my title, Some Reflections on HIFO's Experience with Usefulness and Use of Monitoring and Evaluation. Um, but before going into that, I would like to f make a few opening remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, this is not the first CDI conference I'm attending. And uh, I must say, each year that I've been attending these conferences, they have been very inspiring for me. Uh, I would say they had a big conceptual use for me as evaluation manager in HIVOS. And uh, I can also already say that for these two days, um, part of the conceptual use uh, lies, for example, in the confrontation that I felt yesterday very strongly between the cases presented for South Africa in the plenary and in the working group on Mexico. I said, oh God, what a big institution people are talking about and how difficult it is to deal with monitoring and evaluation there. I come from a much smaller organization. And it doesn't mean that dealing with uh, utilization of monitoring evaluation is easier there. But certainly, I saw a big difference between these two. Uh, don't expect an academic presentation from me. Uh, it's really, I would say, unfinished business. It took time for me to, present, to send in my uh, PowerPoint presentation to Cecile. Actually, I added a few slides this morning. And I'm still in this unfinished business. Uh, so that could also mean that this meeting is very timely for helping me in this business, for mentoring me in this business. And um, coincidentally, it's not me alone in this. Um, within Pachtos, the uh, umbrella organization of Dutch development organizations, we are also running at this moment a small working group, which is dealing exactly with the same subject matter. And I think it was not the one causing the other, certainly not us causing the CDI conference, but even the CDI conference not causing us, so there is some actuality in the subject. Um, saying it's unfinished business, I also want to say that, for example, this morning I heard all kinds of things, say, God, I should have included that in my presentation as well. So it's not complete, uh, but I hope that what I share with you has some meaning and uh, you can have some uh, relationship to it. I work as an evaluation manager, uh, which is not my official title in HIVOS. Uh, I think I'm called like Senior Policy Officer for Monitoring and Evaluation. Um, I decided to use the word, the title evaluation manager uh, after I took a course uh, with Jacques Toulemonde a few years ago in Brussels, which was a course specifically designed for not people doing evaluations, but people commissioning in evaluations. And I found this distinction quite uh, interesting and useful because I think we are in this business from a different perspective. Not contradictory, but certainly different. And that, that's why I also liked uh, Marlene's presentation yesterday also because the view from inside the evaluation unit made me feel at home. Hmm? Now, not all evaluation units are probably the same. I am in a very small one. Actually, uh, for evaluation, the unit is not much bigger than myself. Um, the unit I'm working in uh, is called Audit and Evaluation. In Dutch, it has another acronym. It's called TEC, T-E-C. And the T stands for, uh, how you call that? Toetsing. I don't know how you call that. It's like, a, it's audit. But then the C stands for control. And this is also something I had to think of uh, also when Marlene made a presentation. How are we viewed by our colleagues? How do we view them and how are we viewed? Sometimes we realize that we do not have sufficient uh, empathy in the position of our colleagues. And uh, having more of that could make our work uh, a bit easier. OK, so much for the first slide. I think it's important uh, if you talk about uh, what I think I'm supposed to do, talking about the organizational aspects 
of evaluation use and the conditionings that uh, influence us, it's important to understand what kind of animal we are as an organization. HIVOS is a co-financing organization. It's an organization that benefits from the Dutch co-financing arrangement for development cooperation, which is a funding mechanism that I think almost exists now almost 50 years, but it will not exist much more than one and a half year beyond this moment. Um, historically, the core business of co-financing organizations has been in grant making to southern civil society organizations. We call them apart organizations. And um, it's important to be aware of language. Sometimes the word implementing organizations is used uh, for apart organizations. And then I would say, yes, certainly they are implementing but they are not implementing our programs. They are implementing their own programs. So they are also designing organizations. And uh, considering them partner organizations, there's a lot of idealism maybe in that term, but there is some solid ground in it in precisely that what I just said. It's us providing financial support and some additional support maybe connected to that to work that organizations themselves have decided to do, that, have, that they have designed, and they are not implementing our programs. That has a, a, a meaning for evaluation as well. Just to uh, give you an indication of the size of HIVOS, more or less, um, in 2012, that was the latest published annual report by HIVOS, uh, we were supporting some 700 of those partner organizations spread over 32 countries in the South, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and being uh, serviced by us through six regional offices that we have. When I joined HIVOS, that's about 26 years ago, we didn't have uh, regional offices, we only had an office in The Hague, and since that time, we have been decentralizing our work to the South, uh, operating now six regional offices. In addition to that, six local offices uh, servicing specific country programs, in total, we have some 315 people. Um, I'm one of those 315. Caroline sitting over there is another one of those 315. And in total, we have an expenditure. I could already uh, get that figure for 2013 of 90, 90, 99 million euros. I already made reference to the co-financing program. Uh, a large part, I'm not exactly sure how much of those 99 million, but it's around half of it, uh, comes from the co-financing program. That is from the Dutch Ministry for Foreign Affairs, or more specifically, the Dutch Ministry for Development Cooperation, which has been uh, historically our main source of funding. Uh, the importance, the weight of the Ministry for Development Cooperation in our funding is going down, and it will go down further in the future. Um, but historically, that is what has, I would say, shaped to a large degree our identity and the way of working. And certainly also the largest external factor uh, influencing us. Talking about monitoring and evaluation, I distinguish between two levels. The one I call ME1, and there, later on I'll speak about ME2. ME1 is a very decentralized affair in our organization. Um, and it is related directly to what I already mentioned to you to be the core business of our work, which is grant making to southern NGOs, southern CSOs to be more precise. Um, within the context of that core business, monitoring is not the monitoring of a program we are running, but is, is monitoring of the performance of our partner organizations. So it is basically uh, getting its information from reporting we get from partner organizations, from visits we make to partner organizations, but it's, it's, it's processing information that we receive from our partner organizations on the work they do and for which we provide some of their financial support. When it comes to evaluation, it's a bit different uh, because here we have a practice of ourselves commissioning external evaluations of the work of our partner organizations and of their, of their organizations and of their work. And these evaluations, which we have come to call project evaluations uh, in our jargon, uh, they are commissioned decentrally. 
not by me, not by this department I'm working in, but by program officers as part of their work dealing uh, with the portfolio of partner organizations. Um, in other words, this is non-specialized staff when it comes to monitoring and evaluation. I started as a PO 26 years ago, and I commissioned uh, quite a number of those uh, project evaluations of our partner organizations. Um, since 1980, we have commissioned more than 1,200 of such uh, project evaluations. Um, as I said, I did some of them as a program officer myself. And um, recently, in my current position, I said it would be nice to see, to get a feedback from our program staff uh, on the use they give to these evaluations. Now, to be precise, the object matter of these evaluations, the evaluant, is largely the work of the partner organizations. The commissioners are my colleagues, program staff. Um, when I'm talking about this little survey, I'm referring not to the use partner organizations made of these evaluations, but to the use my colleagues have made of this evaluation, which is quite different. And the other one would certainly merit another investigation, but I'm now referring to the use we make of these evaluations. Um, now, I'm not uh, saying that this little uh, research is completely valid, but I leveled a number of questions at my colleagues and asked them uh, to rate on a number of statements. So the first question uh, I presented them is, overall, this evaluation, I, the report or the evaluation process, generated useful information for HIVOS, being specifically me as a program officer. And actually, I was surprised about the relatively positive score that uh, they gave to these evaluations, because on average, these out of uh, 0 to 10, they rated these, the usefulness of these evaluations with an 8, with some uh, high scores of 10, some uh, low scores uh, at low as, as low as 3. Now, the second question related to whether they made use of the evaluation. And here, I still see a positive score, in my view, a 7.6. Well, of course, you could debate exactly whether it's high or low, but I must say I had expected a lower score uh, on this. People indicated that they actually used the information these evaluations generated. Mind you, this is not a statement on the quality of these evaluations. Um, in the past, we have done several reviews of the quality of these evaluations, and these surveys uh, did not uh, generate very positive uh, uh, findings. One of them was something that Marlene also referred to yesterday. My PO colleagues always want to know everything uh, for 20,000 euro. Hmm? So the TORs of these evaluations are always very long. Hmm? And I would expect that that today has not changed uh, dramatically. But still, what they get from it, they found useful and they say they have used. And um, maybe I should not have been that surprised because I can relate to this uh, when I remember my own practice as a program officer. Uh, and this cuts through all methodological things you might say about evaluations. It is always useful to have a third party reflect on the things you're doing and your partner's doing. And if they write a more or less sensible report on that, it is always helpful. So, um, in that sense, uh, if you talk about the glass being half full or half empty in terms of use, it's, you can say it's certainly half full. You can always give use to things, to, to additional information when it comes from an outside party, which can always help you in, in, in your work. I asked in this uh, little survey also from program staff, what particular use then had they given for, or for what particular purpose did they think it had been quite useful? And uh, logically, uh, the largest group of use that people said they were giving to these reports is when it comes to their specific dealing with this partner organization. So 82% reported that the evaluation report had influenced their approach to the partner organization. In 62% of cases, it had influenced them to change some or the total uh, of their approach to this partner organization. And in 47%, um, it had confirmed their approach. 
And the fact that they don't make up hundreds is not contradictory, I would say, because it could relate to aspects of their approach. Um, in a slightly smaller percentage, uh, staff reported that these evaluations had influenced the wider programmatic thinking of HIVOS, of which that particular program or partner made part. And in a still smaller uh, percentage, uh, staff indicated to have shared this uh, evaluation or its report with a wider audience uh, outside of HIVOS. I now come to what I called ME number two, and this is the monitoring and evaluation which derives from the co-financing arrangement. All that I've said so far is not an obligation of HIVOS. I mean, I think uh, it has become quite a routine in HIVOS, uh, and you could understand if since 1980 we had 1,200 uh, project evaluations, that that is a certain routine, to do these project evaluations, but they are not a, an explicit requirement from our largest donor, the Dutch uh, ministry. This is different. There is a specific monitoring and evaluation obligation following from the co-financing arrangement. Of course, this is full accountability based. And uh, the difference between this monitoring and evaluation level and the other one is that the other one was completely decentralized this is centralized. It has to do with our HIVOS involvement with the ministry. And from being centralized and from having such a decentralized praxis, it requires us to aggregate uh, results in, in, in one report. I will address two parts of it, the monitoring and the evaluation part. Um, I said the co-financing arrangement exists almost 50 years. It doesn't mean that it has always had the same shape. It has changed over time, and after a long period of relative stability, which ran from 1980 to 2002, in the past 12 years we have had seen a number of changes. And the last two changes I uh, refer to in this slide, um, we are now in the current phase called MFS2, and the previous phase ran from 2006 to 2010. In the 2006-2010, period, uh, the ministry uh, wanted to engage with us in what they called tailor-made monitoring. They said, we're not going to impose on you any framework for your monitoring, uh, and monitoring means for your reporting to us. Uh, we want you to use a format that is tailor-made to your program. Um, we like this very much because we said that we apply the same logic to our partner organizations. We don't uh, impose any formats in terms of reporting on our partner organizations. Uh, we have never even imposed logical frameworks. Actually, I've never learned how you make a logical framework. I don't know how to do that. Um, and therefore, we were quite happy with the tailor-made monitoring requirements from the ministry towards us. However, for one reason or the other, they learned and they decided that we're not going to continue with that. So they... Uh, impose on us a more standardized monitoring framework for the current period, and uh, it had to uh, relate to the MDGs. They didn't tell us that our programs would have to do so, but our monitoring has. You can already anticipate that the usefulness and use of this is slightly lower. Um, in terms of evaluation, there has also been um, a development in terms of requirements from the ministry. I think a very good element of the evaluation requirements towards us has been that it's not the ministry that is imposing evaluations on us, but it's telling us, you must do evaluation. Hmm? Uh, again, I was not referring to the project evaluations that I spoke to earlier, uh, but they told us, you will engage in program evaluations. This requirement dates back to 1980, when the co-financing arrangement uh, adopted a very progressive approach in terms of providing funds to us, because we were no longer, as happened in the past, no longer given funds on a project-by-project -project basis, but we were given a bulk funding for a longer period, for which we even did not have to present a proposal. 
we only had to report uh, in our annual programs, and we had, as I said, to engage in a regular process of program evaluations. The requirement of us organizing program evaluations has remained, and uh, I think this has strongly contributed to the sense of ownership that we feel with these evaluations. And uh, particularly in the period 2002-2010, the ministry, or to be more precise, it's not the funding part, but it's the evaluation department of the ministry, has engaged in uh, what I would call quality support for us as evaluation commissioners. It was quality support uh, after the deal. We would submit the evaluations we had commissioned and that were completed, and we would be given some kind of feedback in terms of quality. Of course, in a, in a quality in a limited sense, uh, under the rubrics of validity, reliability, and utility. Uh, but however limited that might have been, um, I can say, and a number of my colleagues uh, can confirm that, that that engagement with the ministry's evaluation department has been a very fruitful and useful exercise. So much so that we feel a stark contrast between that period and the current period when it comes to evaluation requirements. It is still the case that the responsibility, the onus of organizing evaluations is with us. However, the requirements for doing that have changed uh, quite considerably. And uh, I think the basic, the basic underlying concept uh, for the change requirements are twofold. One, is an emphasis on independence. And independence was also a term you used yesterday, and we have had our dealing with this independence issue. The ministry told us, based on your previous engagement, the 2002-2010 period, we think that your evaluations uh, were quite okay when it comes to independence. Independence was one of the sub-criteria under the reliability uh, chapter. However, we think that they should become more independent now, and therefore you are no longer supposed to be the commissioning agent, but you will have to find yourself another commissioning agent. That's one. The other one, I didn't mention it specifically here, um, uh, is related to evaluation quality in a more narrow sense of the word, and this is very much connected to the recent debate of the past 10 years about evidence-based, rigorous evaluation um, with RCTs as the sort of scapegoat uh, extreme form of that. And uh, as I would in general say about the requirements of the ministry, or maybe the requirements of back donors in general, there's always a positive part to it and there's a negative part to it. The positive part uh, I would connect to the quality support we have been receiving in the past period related to the fact, okay, you have presented these evaluations, they're more or less okay, but what about the attribution question? Can you answer the attribution question? And very often we couldn't. So we were quite, we were quite keen in delving deeper into that issue of the attribution question because I didn't come across anyone who said, to hell with the attribution question, we accept it, that it's a real and useful question. However, we felt that the answer or the way of approaching the attribution question was now or less, more or less imposed on us. And uh, this relates to the kinds of designs that we were supposed to uh, apply, or not we, but the ones who were going to do the evaluations, the designs to apply to the current evaluation. Um, which is, I could say, quasi-experimental, working with control groups, uh, baseline, uh, endline measurement, and things like that. Again, partly we would agree with it, but not as a wholesale imposed arrangement for the whole evaluation. We are still suffering with that, and with us a number of evaluators in it, but this is about the evaluation. So, when I come to the use and the usefulness of the MNE level two, I would say the quality emphasis has been an enhancing factor, and when I say that, I basically relate to the previous period. I also see that it has become, or the emphasis on quality that's imposed now, has become also a limiting factor, as has independence. 
Um, now, I specifically relate this to usefulness and use, because the independence and the quality uh, requirements together have caused an enormous distance between not only us as the co-financing agencies, but also those projects and partners who are the object of the evaluation and the evaluation exercise. And uh, this may be necessary within a certain concept of independence and design, but we seriously, and I would say I, seriously question the way we will be able to use these evaluations, i.e. their usefulness. There was another uh, limitation which uh, applied in general to the program evaluations, not only the ones under this period, but also under the previous period, limiting their usefulness, um, which derived from a requirement of the Dutch uh, Ministry of Finance covering evaluations. It states that you must, your evaluations must cover a sufficiently large portfolio in terms of money, because what, what we get from the government is money, and so we have to account for as much money as possible with evaluations, which meant that the object of these individual program evaluations was very broad, very wide, and therefore limiting the depth that uh, these evaluations could reach in individual cases, which uh, served us in our accountability purpose, but limited us Certainly in the instrumental use of these evaluations, I would not say in the conceptual use, I think there was still a, a usefulness at that level. The future does not end in 2015, but uh, the future will certainly be different than uh, the past 50 years when it comes to our funding. Um, the traditional grant maker role, which the co-financing uh, arrangement made possible for us, will become less and less dominant, less and less predominant, simply because the co-financing arrangement itself will become much smaller and will become much more specific. With this, at least I'm now speaking for HIVOS as one of the organizations having to deal with this uh, uncertain future, uh, comes along um, a self identity or self identification which goes beyond the traditional grant maker role funding work of independent partner organizations and will see us being more involved with partner organizations in direct responsibility for implementation of programs. And this goes along with the much greater fundraising pressure that we're under. Um, and in terms of the M&E uh, situation, the type of programs I expect us to be involved in in the future where it's not the grant maker role, but being in a much more implementing role, will also make monitoring the evaluation something more directly of our own programs. We're not evaluating partners' programs anymore. We will have to be dealing with monitoring and evaluation of our own programs. And I, I refer to my colleague Carolyn in here. She works in such a program, and she is the monitoring and evaluation officer in that program. Well. Um, in normal, uh, he was dealing as grant maker. We only have one person with an M&E definition, that's me. So more likely we will have more people specialized in M&E in the future. That's what I said, more specialist M&E staff. And hopefully, mentioning the last item on this slide, we will be able to move M&E more up or more to more forward. Uh, there are, uh, other acronyms are invoked today, which is PMEL or DMEL, and uh, putting evaluation and monitoring not at the end of the program, but making it a much more integral part of the design. And since we will be more directly involved in uh, designing programs, it will be up upon ourselves to do that. That's how far I got with the first part of my presentation. And I said to Seal, well, finally in my presentation, I will try to interpret Hever's experience using Stephen Hoyland's analysis in his article, Evaluation Use in the Organizational Context Change and Focus to Improve Theory, which was a recent article uh, in uh, evaluation, which deals with this organizational context, which I thought maybe that's useful for me to uh, finish my presentation. 
uh, when I was reading this yesterday and this morning, I said, okay, there's some use in it, but maybe not all. And uh, I came up with two slides which go a bit in this direction, but which do help, I think, to contextualize even more uh, the kind of monitoring and evaluation field we are in. And I think one way of uh, explaining that is to say we are in the field of development cooperation. Hmm? And this is a very contested field. Um, it combines high public expectations. I mean, uh, we are supposed actually to bring happiness to everybody in the South. That's about the expectation of development cooperation. So there's a lot of idealism in there. Hmm? On the other hand, there are those who are completely skeptical about development cooperation and who would like to kill it rather today than tomorrow because it only fuels corruption and who knows what bad things there are. Um, the ones who would try to uh, manage this say, okay, let's, let's look uh, for value for money. Huh? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the way the politicians try to, uh, to combine all these different expectations. Um, I want to say, and now um, I come to a reflection about the, how should I say that? Um, the word use sounds quite neutral. And if you talk about different ways of looking at use, people are a bit skeptical when they talk about um, legitimizing use or symbolic use. Hmm? It's like, it's not the best kind of use that you should make. Hmm? It's a second class use. I would say that would be true in an ideal world, but in a political world, symbolic and legitimizing use are extremely important. Hmm? And therefore, I think um, it is important to not look at the various categories of use in the same way. And I, that's at least my understanding at this moment. And you have to connect use and purpose. Hmm? So if we start with the classical distinction between learning and accountability, I would say those project evaluations that I was referring to in the beginning, for HIVOS, they are learning evaluations. For the partner organizations, of course, they are part of their accountability to us, but for us, they're learning evaluations. Our way of dealing with the ministry is, of course, very much clad in the accountability uh, sphere. And I would say that the notions of instrumental or conceptual or non-use uh, could apply to the learning part. That's why I see. Um, and that legitimizing and symbolic use and non-use are very important in the accountability sphere. And since, to me, the accountability sphere is not a neutral sphere, um, therefore, I see perfect use for legitimizing and symbolic uses. Uh, uh, Marlene was talking about the way the press could uh, twist the meanings of evaluations. Now, it's upon us, and therefore, I think the communication part that we have been talking about is so important. It's part of the framing, and you, you need it, and you have to do your framing, and you have to make use of your, of your evaluations in a way that's appropriate. Now, one thing that I took from the uh, article that I thought to be using more than I did relates a bit to the kind of work that you do. It makes, it makes a distinction between organization when it comes to propensity to evaluate, and it makes a, an extreme it has an extreme between what they call action organization and political organization. And I think we are both. We are a, an action organization and a political organization. And it depends a bit on the kind of work we are in. And actually the uh, current uh, MFS2 evaluation, which looks at results at the level of direct poverty alleviation, it looks at the result of civil society building and lobbying advocacy, shows nicely this spectrum. Not all these fields are equally easily evaluable in terms of outputs and outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I would say in your accountability role or in your accountability fight, in the political fight, you use whatever means you have. If you have good evaluation showing that you produce perfect outcomes, you use them, of course. But not all your work is 
easy, as easily evaluated in that sense. So you will have to twist also some of your evaluations which deal with much more, um, much, uh, I wouldn't say abstract, but more difficultly expressible in outcomes also in that same vein. And uh, to finalize, to connect with process and findings, um, internally, process use uh, is probably the most important use uh, that people give to evaluation because it goes along with the ownership of an evaluation process, which we have always been able to do. Organizing the evaluation, asking the right questions, is almost half of the deal. And uh, so I think, yes, process use is certainly relevant for us. Um, findings uh, also, at, when it comes to findings, and maybe because the process use is so prominent in the organization, I would say we are not very strong on given, giving formal follow-up to evaluation findings in the terms of, uh, of management response, in the terms of following up on uh, uh, recommendations that we promise to be implementing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's certainly uh, something to be won there. But since a lot of it also is decentralized, tacitly taking place, I think we would mm, probably find more use than you could uh, derive from the things that are documented on paper. And I think that that ends my presentation. Does anybody have any questions or ideas or thoughts they would like to Don't share? Don't you dare. I was curious in one of the slides, you said that you see in the future Hivos moving to be more of an implementer more directly. Uh, I was just curious if you could share why you see that happening. What's the main motivation for uh, being directly involved rather than just continuing to work through partners? I should specify a bit more because we internally are also a bit uh, confused. We're not exactly sure about that. What I at least see us moving away from is from the broad grant making that we've been doing. Now. Um, not all that will come uh, will be non-grant making, but there is uh, a section that we have been moving into much more, is more specific grant making. Hmm? It's very much connected to our funding sources. I mean, I don't expect us to come across another funding source which will have the same characteristics of the MFS program, which allowed us to be these general grant makers. So, uh, but we have come across uh, other sources of funds which still um, make us grant maker, uh, but grant maker for a specific purpose. I mean, this has to do also with something that I did not speak about, but which has been one of the changes in the co-financing arrangement on the run. Uh, and this relates to the financial contribution the ministry is willing to make to our work. In the original uh, situation, co-financing meant the possibility of 100% funding. Hmm? The word co uh, did not mean very much money in the past. Let's say um, it was acceptable to the ministry that partner organizations would sub sub put some voluntary labor and that that would be classified as the contribution and that all the funds would come from the ministry. So when we are now at the current situation, the ministry a few years ago decided that they would not fund more than 75% of our uh, turnover, which meant we had forcefully to find other funding sources and uh, this has been solved by the different Dutch co-financing agencies in different ways. Uh, HIVOS did not have the possibility of attracting a lot of fund, funds from private individual citizens in the Netherlands. So one way for us of uh, dealing with this problem was to go out and see whether other big funders, and uh, I'm talking about the other bilaterals or multilaterals or um, private foundations in the United States, would be willing to fund through us. And this has led to a number of specific funds that we manage for specific purposes, which still, as I said, imply a number of 
grant making functions, but more specific for, uh, for example, uh, media support in East Africa or for support to LGBT organizations. We have some of those specific funds, which also involve um, a more proactive approach next to being grant maker, maybe in line with what you explained yesterday in terms of your connection to your partner organizations. So the element of capacity development for partner organizations becomes stronger. Um, and I would not be able, or I could, could mention another fund which still has some grant making in it, but where the implementing part is even stronger. Can you cut it short a little bit? I have to cut it short a little bit. Uh, a fund to uh, promote the development of biogas um, in, in Africa, for example, which involves us handling funds, but to a large degree involves us in promoting um, a whole concept. Hmm? So that's the proactive part that uh, I see as moving into much more. Well, my question, uh, Carol, is about the governance aspect, because one thing you mentioned is that um, there is a new arrangement going on uh, uh, where the uh, commissioning role is handed out, is outsourced to another party. How does that function? Yeah, that's uh, a good one. What a short response, this is you? No, no, as I said, the reason was that uh, the independence uh, was no longer vested in us. Short, huh? Yeah. Um, we found the Dutch Council for Scientific Research to be the willing partner to be the commissioner of the evaluations we are responsible for. And we, yeah, and then the Votro. The Votro is, Votro is now acting as the commissioner of the evaluations that we have to have implemented. Um, in terms of the use of evaluations, in a period when you've got a reduction in resources, are, re are evaluations now seen to be far more punitive uh, than they were in the past? Because you've got two things happening. You've got a change in the way evaluations are handled, and you've got a reduction in resources. Mm -hmm. In our context, uh, that's, that's had huge implications in terms of the way uh, most of the parties who are being evaluated on or against uh, are, uh, are looking at evaluation. No, I, let's say it would be punitive from our side to our partners. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, I don't think the evaluations that have been commissioned by HIVOS, either the ones that have been directly involved in commissioning or uh, the ones that my colleague POs commission, I don't think they are more or less punitive than they were in the past. I mean, so I would say some of my colleagues had this purpose in mind of being punitive or let's say not having the guts to tell a partner right away, sorry, your program is shit, we're going to finish it and we're always very uh, um, welcoming an evaluation that would say that for them. Huh? But I, I have not come across uh, the trend that with a reduction in, in, in funding, the, the evaluation use would be more punitive. This change to put the emphasis on independence to me has great uh, impact on the use because if there's nobody inside the organization promoting use, then the use aspect gets also outsourced, right? This is a very familiar situation that goes on in a lot of organizations. And in my many reorganizations, the 11 I went through, each time it came up, let's outsource evaluation management. And I'd say, please, you know, I can set up my business tomorrow. It'd be perfect for me. But you won't get the same use. And they understood that, you know, quite well. The, the arguments I used to say, if you keep it inside, you've got some possibility of promoting and keeping that, uh, that use going. Absolutely. But once you put it outside, it's, it's put into danger. No, they, I agree with you. And I would say my colleague evaluation managers in the other organizations also agree with you. That, I mean... Um, it, it was this accountability evaluation that was now outsourced. It doesn't tell us that we should not commission evaluations anymore. And we are still uh, on the side of this. We still commission evaluations. But even accountability has some learning as far as I'm concerned. So it's that learning part of accountability should be promoted in the organization. Yes. Now, as I said, uh, and the Dutch football player Johan Cruyff said, um, every disadvantage has its benefits. Uh, and even this one has some benefits but it would be to uh, take too much time to explain those benefits. <laughs>